All righty. So let's start with the syllabus. Again, my name is Mr. Dion, and I'm going to be your instructor for General College Chemistry 1. So this is Chemistry 111-175. 175 is our section. Now, historically, General Chemistry 1 at PPCC, which I've taught many times, has always been completely taught as a face-to-face -face class at the Rampart Range or the Centennial Campus. But on account of the pandemic, we're going to have to get a little creative. Now, I'm sure that many of you have already done some of your education um, since the pandemic broke out around March. And so you're probably used to some of this already. But I'm going to teach this class using a variety of methods. We're going to use um, uh, real-time lectures during our lecture time, just like we're doing right now. And we'll be doing that on Microsoft Teams. I'll also be posting some YouTube videos, some videos that are made by one of my colleagues who is actually the chair of the department, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then, of course, we're going to be meeting face-to-face -face for the lab. So again, if your name falls in between A and FA, so you are going to be meeting me tonight at the lab at Rampart Range, and of course, you'll have to bring your own mask um, for this evening. Anyhow. Another thing that might be new to some of you is a, a software that we're using called Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor. And what Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor are is they're simply tools that instructors use to level the playing field of their students. It basically monitors you while you take your exam. So let's say you're a very honest person and you would never think of, you know, cheating on an exam, but one of your colleagues would cheat on an exam. Would cheat on an exam. And I'm, I, I know that none of you would do that. But anyhow, um, in the event that somebody was, you know, uh, prone to cheating, this will alleviate that because everybody is being monitored and it really helps to level things out during the testing process. And of course, I'll provide more information about that once we get closer and closer to the first exam. And I have a whole set of instructions about how Respondus Lockdown Browser works at the end of the syllabus. And on top of that, I can do you one more, is that um, on our class's D2L page, I've also posted a practice exam for exam one, which closely mirrors the content, the scope, the number of questions that will be on your first real exam. And that exam, I've set it up so that you have to use Respondus so that you can get in the habit of using that. Now, before I even get into more meat and potatoes here, some of you may be wondering, well, uh, Mr. Dion, um, what, what if I don't have the right computer, you know? Well, um, there are some computers on campus that you can use at the Centennial Campus and at Rampart Range and even at the downtown campus that you can use. They have Respondus Lockdown Browser already installed on them. And I will post an announcement to D2L, which will tell you exactly which computers and which campus they are on. So I'm not gonna leave you in the dark with respect to that. Um, a little more information here, our lectures are Tuesday and Thursday. I would love to do all synchronous lectures, but just the reality is that on Tuesdays, I have to be at Rampart Range at 7 p.m. and lecture technically is supposed to end at 6.50 p.m. And you can see the issue there is that I don't live 10 minutes away and I'm sure most of you don't live 10 minutes away from campus. And so generally speaking, I'll try to end lecture around 6 p.m. Um, on Tuesdays. And then Thursdays, I will either take up the whole time or I will post a video or something like that. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll keep updating D2L announcements as we move along through the semester. So you'll, you'll always know what the heck is going on. Our labs, again, are at the Rampart Range campus. Again, if your name, your surname um, falls between A and FA, we're going to be meeting tonight, tonight. And if your name falls in between, what did I say, FR? So starting with Alyssa France. So if your name falls between FR to the letter Z, it, you're going to meet next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. All right. I am not a permanent faculty member at Pikes Peak Community College. I am an adjunct faculty, even though I've taught here for years. And so I don't have an office, but I do have an email. And you can always contact me that way. In fact, many of you have already. There are some important dates here, like the drop date and the withdraw date, holidays, so on and so forth. Um, let's get down to the important stuff. The prerequisites for this class are um, Chemistry 101 or some kind of equivalent, as well as Math 121. I won't be reteaching things like algebra, 
um, to you or anything like that. It won't be, um, you know, a lot of the content that you would have learned in those classes you were responsible for in this class. Again, our textbook is the 13th edition of Chang, so chemistry 13th edition. An older version of the book is also fine. Um, if you want to pay for an ebook, that works as well. Whatever you use is fine with me. If you're interested in taking general chemistry two in the spring or maybe another semester, it might be wise to buy the full book instead of just the split edition from the bookstore. Um, something that's really nice in this class is that your lab manual is available for free. It's posted to D2L, so you have total access to that. And in fact, um, if you're coming to the lab tonight, I'll go over that a little bit with you. Again, if your name falls, your surname falls in between FR and the letter Z, um, I'll go over it next week with you. You also need to have some kind of lab notebook. So some kind of bound lab notebook that has um, spiral binding with carbonless copies. And if you're wondering, what the heck is that? Well, if you go to the bookstore at Rampart Range or at Centennial, believe you me, they will know what you're talking about when you ask for this. And you do have to have the proper laboratory notebook. What else do you need in general chemistry? I would recommend have I would recommend having a very good scientific calculator and always having that by your side. You need your own safety goggles. We're not sharing safety goggles um, during the pandemic. That would be a bad idea. Something else that's required, especially in the days of COVID, are a reliable internet connection in order to participate in lectures like the one that you're in currently. And also, um, uh, you're also going to need it for taking your exams. Um, there you go. Somebody asked, can the lab notebook be used? The answer is no. So there is no lab notebook to speak of for this class. There is the inquiry lab manual, which is available exclusively online free of charge. There is nothing in that book that you will fill in the blanks or anything like that. So you need a proper lab notebook, a carbon, um, uh, carbonless copies, spiral binding lab notebook. What else? I mean, hopefully you all took the time to read the entire syllabus before this evening. I posted several announcements and I send you a couple of emails about that. But one of the best ways to become successful in chemistry class is to make sure that you attend every class. And on top of that, you know, I could add what else? Watch every video, read every announcement, and then do all of the practice problems. If my child was in this class, if I had a loved one that was taking this class, you know what I would tell them? The best way to be successful in chemistry is to practice, 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 is to do practice problems until you can't stand it anymore. Anyhow, I'll let you read the test conduct policy and lab behavior and whatnot, because I'm going to be going over more of the lab um, in the lab with you, and I'll talk a little bit more about it tonight as well. Um, I will take attendance online and I will take attendance in the lab. Let's move down here and talk about, ooh, let's talk about missing exams. There's no makeup exams, especially since they're all online. Uh, let's see here. How do you get a good grade in this class? Well, there's a total of five exams. I will drop your lowest score. They make up 50% of your total grade. We have labs. I think we have nine labs this semester and um, we have a lab practical as well. We also have quizzes or homework. There is no homework tab in D2L. There's only a quizzes tab. So the homework is actually under the quizzes tab. And I'll show you that in a little bit. All right, here's a page that I would recommend every single person who's hearing my voice right now print. I would recommend that you print this and keep it in a safe place, put it on your wall or something, because this is what we're gonna try to stick to. You can see that right away, we have an exam coming up on September 3rd. And the reason, if you're like, wow, that's pretty soon. The reason why we do that is because um, the drop date is um, September 8th and we like to provide you with enough feedback so that you can make a decision. If you think, wow, maybe I'm in over my head or something like that in general chemistry or I don't have the time for the class, you would be able to drop the course and get your money back. And so you can see everything that I have planned for the semester, again, some of these will be synchronous lectures, just like you're in right now. Some of them will be videos. And again, I will provide more information about that as the course progresses. Here's our lab schedule. I will remind you for the third time tonight that if your, la if your last name falls between A and what did I say? Um, F-A, 
you are going to be in Group A. And if your surname falls in between FR and the letter Z, you are going to be in Group B. So let's say your last name was Basta. You will be meeting me tonight on August 25th because your last name begins with the letter B and B falls between A and FA. And the reason why we have to divide it that way is because we are allowed a maximum of 12 students at a time in the Rampart Range Lab. And you can see all the beautiful labs that we have planned. In fact, tonight when you come to the lab or if you're in next week's group, we're gonna not only do our drawer check-in and talk about safety rules, but we're also gonna do a little um, assignment that is called first day lab tasks. And I put that in an announcement or in an email that I sent to you that you should print that out and bring it with you this evening. It can be found on D2L. So I would recommend printing out not only the lecture schedule, but also the lab schedule. Let's see, lab guidelines. Um, we have pre and post lab assignments. I will go over that with you in the lab. I'll talk to you about lab safety and lab reports in the lab as well. Let's see here. Help outside of the classroom. You can read all that. And then at the very end of the syllabus, and this is something new. This is a COVID, a post-COVID thing, okay? It's all the instructions for Respondus Lockdown Browser. It would take me a long time to go over all of this. So I expect you to read all of this before your next class or before attempting anything with Respondus. And there's a really nice YouTube video here that explains what Respondus is, so on and so forth. So that is a brief overview, and I've really covered all the, of what I consider the most important points of the syllabus. And now I'm going to take a look at our classes page on D2L. And I think that everybody or virtually everybody has already logged into D2L. I saw that some people even finished the safety quiz already. I was quite impressed by that. But I'm the kind of person that likes to check my Twitter feed, I don't know, maybe 20 times a day. And so I know that it doesn't take a lot to check something on the internet quickly. And I would recommend that you check D2L every day, maybe even a couple times a day, just to quickly look to see if there are any new announcements. And you can see that my last announcement, I have already completed, or Dr. Garcia, sorry, already completed the video lectures for all of chapter one. So I'll, I'll just ask you guys, did anybody watch these in their entirety or watch my videos? Because that also posted videos that covered most of it. All right. Bruce says yes. Awesome. That's awesome. Great. Because she worked really hard on those and I worked really hard on mine as well. So um, again, Dr. Garcia's lectures, videos, they cover the entire thing, the entire chapter from soup to nuts. Um, but my videos, uh, my videos only covered, I think, up to section 1.7 or something like that. Anyhow, so I will, again, I'll be posting more and more um, um, uh, I'll be posting more and more announcements about videos as we progress. So whoever just wrote uh, mine were PowerPoint slides and not videos. So what you have to do is you download those PowerPoint slides and then you click the play button and you can hear the instructor's voice narrating those slides. Trust me, they're not just PowerPoint slides. There There is also a recording in there, but you may have to download it and click play on it. All right. Anyhow. Um, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. syllabus and schedule, lab manual. So let me show you some of the cool things that are on D2L. So first of all, the course home. The next thing is the content. I'm gonna switch over to um, uh, student mode. I'm gonna impersonate Ernie Aardvark here, just so you'll see ex exactly what you see when you log in. So under content, this is your bread and butter, people. This is where all the magic happens, right? You have the syllabus and schedule. So here's our syllabus. I also put this prefixes and numerical values for SI units in there. I don't know why I put it in the syllabus and schedule. I just left it there. Um, you can see that in the year 2019, we worked really hard on our slides. Um, uh, me and Dr. Garcia put a lot of these together. Anyhow, so all of the slides for all of the chapters are completely there. They're all PowerPoints, so you can download them, You know, convert them to PDFs, print them out however you want, scribble on them, do whatever you want. Um, what else? So after lecture slides, I have a link for recorded lecture slides. Again, you might have to download these and click play. These are the ones that are done by Dr. Garcia. Next, you have your lab manual. You know, most chemistry classes that I've ever taken, you always had to buy a lab manual, but in this class, you don't have to buy it. It is free, and it says right here, 
my inquiry lab manual, Chem 111 Fall 2020 COVID. And that was written by one of the chairs of the chemistry department at PPCC. And of course, I will go over um, the, the nuances to that lab manual with you in detail in the lab face-to-face. -face. What else? You also have an example lab report that you could take a look at to get an idea of what we expect. Let's see, we get the lab here. So we expect everybody to um, watch all of these videos that are on here. And you're like, what, all of these? Yeah, the fire extinguisher after the rainbow, experimenting with danger, so on and so forth. And then we expect you to complete a safety quiz. And then there's also a little part of this first day lab tasks at the top that you will have to watch those videos to complete. So um, make sure you complete the safety quiz. Again, two people did. I, I, I don't remember who, who they were, but I looked and they both did exceedingly well. And in fact, you even get a couple of, um, a couple of um, cracks at it. Um, this is another really important one is suggested practice problems. If I could give one message to the people of the future, it would be suggested practice problems. So if you look in our textbook, these are all the problems that Mr. Dion handpicked and recommends that you try. And, I, and so it says chapter one, um, 1.4, 10, 12, 13, 14. I didn't write 1.4, 1.10, 1.12 every time because that gets kind of redundant. I would recommend doing all of those problems, not half, not 90%, 100%. And if you're like, well, where would I find the answers to these? Ha, ha, ha. You would look right here in solutions to practice problems. And you see right here, look, this is embarrassing. But um, you're going to see, oh, I must have typed some of them out, I guess. But anyhow, some of them have my handwriting, and I guess some of them I just posted. Anyhow, I don't, didn't remember. Anyhow, there you go. So I do have all the answers up there for you. What else? Solutions to practice problems. Oh, here, here we go. Uh, anyhow, they're in there. Post-lab questions, practice exams. We'll talk about that when we need it. Team tables, we'll talk about that when we need it. What else is important on D2L? Um, the next most important thing I'd say are the quiz is the quizzes tab. So if you click on quizzes, and if you're like, why is why is homework found in qu in quizzes? Again, there's no homework tab in D2L, so we just call it quizzes. You can see that what you have due is you have the safety quiz, which is due by September 8th, and you get two cracks at that. I always give you two attempts for any of your homework or practice exams. So you can see here, Chem 111. HW1, that's homework one. You have two chances for that. It's due on September 2nd. Homework two is due on uh, September 12th. Uh, you get two chances of that. The same thing with the practice exam. And I will make these available as the semester progresses. And you can see all the way down here that I have a, what is it, exam one, exam two, exam three. Anyhow, and I will post a practice exam for exam one, and I will give you access to that um, very soon. In fact, here it is right here, practice exam one. So what the heck am I talking about? It's already done. Okay, anyhow, somebody just wrote, do we have to turn in the suggested practice problems? Absolutely not. That is for your own personal edification. All right, so that covers pretty much everything that you need to know about um, um, D2L and the syllabus to get us rocking and rolling here. And what else? Again, in the lab, the labs are pretty long. They go from 7 until 9.45. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time tonight and next Tuesday talking about, um, uh, about the lab and what the expectations are there. Somebody asked, are the practice tests timed like the real ones? Yes, they are. All right. So um, let's get going here and talk about chemistry for a little bit. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in our notes. Da, 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 da. No, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this. Da, 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 da. Stop impersonating. Stop trying to be somebody you're not, right? Stop impersonating Ernie. World-renowned Ernie impersonator. And I'm going to assume, since I posted several announcements about watching the videos, that I want to skip ahead a little bit in our lecture slides, and I want to get all the way to solving some problems okay solving some problems so again um, i'm hoping that you all looked at um, my introduction or dr garcia's looked at the scientific method law and theory defining chemistry mixtures how to separate a mixture what an element is um, an element is simply a substance that cannot be separated into simpler substance substances by chemical 
means, and I spoke about that. I even went over all of these commonly used elements, their names, their atomic symbols. And I want to skip over the states of matter. Not that it's not important. Again, I expect you to watch the video, but in the interest of time, I want to skip ahead to around here and start talking about SI units. SI stands for Système International, which is French for the International System of Units. And all of the units that we use in chemistry can all be derived from these base units here. So for length, we use the meter, which we abbreviate the M. For mass, we use the kilogram. Time, we use the second. Electrical current, we're not going to worry about current a whole heck of a lot in this class. Temperature, we use the Kelvin. Amount of substance, we use the mole. And also the candela, or luminous intensity. We won't be stressed about that a whole lot in this class. But what you notice here is that with all of these units, none of them have a prefix except for the kilogram. The kilogram does have a prefix, but none of the other units have prefixes. And so it's a good idea to be familiar with some of the prefixes that we use with SI units. So for example, in one centimeter, we would have, so say we were talking about the centimeter, right, centi, we would have um, one one hundredth of a meter, for exa example. And if you're like, Mr. Dion, you're going really fast here. Well, I'm going to get into some examples here, and there's no better way to learn um, chemistry than to do some practice problems. Um, I'll just talk about volume a little bit. Um, the SI derived unit for volume is the cubic meter. And um, you can see here that some other things that you should know is that one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cubed. And you can see the size of a centimeter cubed. Well, it's actually kind of had to because this isn't the scale. But here's one centimeter cubed. And if we have a thousand centimeters cubed, we have one decimeter cubed, okay? one liter or a thousand milliliters. I'm sure that many of you who have taken chemistry before are familiar with the um, formula for density. And that density is mass over volume. Usually in chemistry class, oops, usually in chemistry class, we are more concerned with reporting our densities in grams, oops, in what? In grams per centimeter cube. You're gonna see that more often than not even though the SI derived unit for density is the kilogram per meter cubed. And here we have some densities for some substances. And I wanted to kick it off right here. So I'm kind of jumping in a little bit harsh here, but let's give it a try and see if we can solve some problems. Is the gold, who knows the atomic symbol for gold? Can anybody tell me? Darn right. I see that everybody typed in AU. You're absolutely correct. So gold is AU. Gold is a precious metal that is chemically unreactive. That's why it's so valuable, because when you make gold jewelry, it doesn't tarnish like many other metals do. It is used mainly in jewelry, dentistry, and electronic devices. A piece of gold ingot has a mass of 301 grams and has a volume of 15.6 centimeters cubed. Calculate the density of gold. Well, to calculate the density of gold, we're simply going to use the formula that density is equal to mass over volume. The good news is that we've already been given our mass right here, and we've already been given our volume right here. And I don't know if you've ever heard the expression that's used in mass sometimes, the old plug and chug, just put the numbers in. So our mass, our numerator, is going to be 301 grams, and our volume is going to be 15.6 centimeters cubed. And when you punch that into your calculator, you end up with 19.3 grams per centimeter cube. All right. So we're going to talk about significant figures in a little bit, but somebody typed or somebody put into the answer, they put 19.29 grams per centimeter cube. The only problem with that answer is that there's one too many significant figures. And again, I will talk about that in a little bit time for, uh, if we have time. Let's try another problem. It says here, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Who follows me on the first problem of the class? Density is equal to mass over volume. Got it. All right. One person. Okay. Tyler. <laughs> Does anybody else follow me? Good. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. That's great. Great. Awesome. Okay, good. 
So you follow me on that one? Well, it's like the old frog in boiling water analogy. Let's turn up the heat a little bit here. It says the, densis, the density of mercury, the only metal that is a liquid at room temperature, is 13.6 grams per milliliter. In fact, there are only two elements on the periodic table that are liquids at room temperature. Does anybody know what the second one is? And you're not expected to know this. This is just more of a trivia. Mercury is a liquid. There's one other one. This would be a good Jeopardy question, maybe. Okay, if nobody knows, I'll tell you. It's bromine, okay? So bromine is a liquid, too. Anyhow, let's move on. Um, so we're given the density of mercury, and it, it says calculate the mass if we have 5.50 milliliters of the liquid. Well, let's use our formula. Density is equal to mass over volume. And we want to solve this problem for mass. And so if we multiply both sides by volume, you can see that volume is going to cancel out on this side. And what we end up with is a new equation, which is mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. Let's try plugging in some numbers and see what happens. Let's plug in 13.6 grams per milliliter, and we'll multiply that by 5.50 milliliters. And you can see that the units are going to cancel milliliters and milliliters and when you punch that into your calculator you should end up with 74.8 grams all right give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one all right great awesome remember if you have any questions feel free to either unmute your mic that works or you can just you know, throw me a question in the chat. I do my best to answer the questions in the chat. Sometimes it's a little tough for me to kind of do two things at once, but I'm a professional. I will rise above it, right? Anyhow, a comparison of temperature scales. I'm not going to go over this in dirty detail because I do in my videos, and I know that Dr. Garcia did in hers as well, but there's a few formulas on here that you have to have memorized for your first exam. In fact, I know that Tyler already does have them memorized because he was my student. And you have to know um, the freezing point of water in degrees Celsius, which is zero degrees. And you should know the boiling point of water in degrees Celsius, which is 100 degrees Celsius. The Kelvin scale, which is shown on the far right, is over here. And you can see that in order to get the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water in Kelvin, all you have to do is add 273. And so that brings me to this formula right here. If you want to convert from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, all you do is add 273. Now over here, they've added a couple extra sig figs to 0.15. There aren't going to be many instances in this class where you'll get you know, any kind of problem, whether you use 273 or 273.15. I like to use 273.15 just to be more, um, more accurate. Also, I'm sure that all of you are probably familiar with, or most of you are probably familiar with the Fahrenheit scale, right? That's what we use here in America, and it's also used in Libya. And you should also memorize this formula right here, which is the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths multiplied by the temperature in degrees Celsius, and then we add 32. Now you might be asking, do I have to memorize a formula degrees Celsius, you know? And that so, that so that I can convert into degrees Celsius from Fahrenheit, you can, you can do that, or you can just memorize this formula here and then derive um, the formula for the conversion from Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius from that equation. Now that equation, I believe, I thought I had it somewhere else in here, but anyhow, it's it's neither here nor there. Um, anyhow. Let's try one problem from this slide because I don't have enough room to solve all of them, but we'll give this one here a kick at the can. It says that solder is an alloy made of tin and lead, and the atomic symbols for tin and lead are not intuitive. Tin is SN and lead is PB. Um, solder is an alloy made of tin and lead that is used in electronic circuits. A certain solder has a melting point of 224 degrees Celsius. What is, its, um, what is its melting point in degrees Fahrenheit? All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this formula right here. We're going to use this formula. So I'll rewrite it over here if I can find a good spot to do it. 
Anyhow, let me just check. One second. So let's write it over here. I'm going to write it kind of small. We'll put degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths multiplied by the temperature in degrees Celsius. And then after that, we add 32. So then we can plug in our numbers. So we have nine fifths, nine divided by five, multiplied by our temperature, which is 224 degrees Celsius. I'm going to leave the units out. I'm going to leave those out because we're converting to Fahrenheit. And then I add 32. Excuse me here while I grab my calculator and I take 9 divided by 5. Oops. Gives you 1.8. And then I multiply by 224. And that gives me 403. And then I'm going to add 32 to that. So if I add 32, I end up with 4. Oops. 435, uh, 435 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, is there anybody who's online right now who, who is already familiar with significant figures a little bit? Has anybody heard of significant figures before they enrolled in this class? Okay, cool. Cool. Some people have. All right. And I'm going to, okay, I'm going to assume that some people have, but in case you haven't, okay, in case you haven't, you know, you might be, or even if you have learned, um, significant figures. Um, you might be wondering, you know, Mr. Dion, shouldn't you have more significant figures or less significant figures? Well, I'm going to cover all of that in this chapter, okay? All right, so let's move forward. Um, let's move forward because I solved these other two problems in my YouTube video, and I know that Dr. Garcia did as well. This is a really interesting chemistry in action. It's the kind of little tidbits that um, Dr. Chang put in the textbook, and this is the story of the Mars Climate Orbiter, you could Google it, it's, you know. Um, NASA took a lot of heat for this one, I think, no pun intended, because uh, just because of an incorrect unit conversion, they ended up spending, what, um, 125 million bucks or something like that? I don't know. Anyhow, it was a crazy amount of money. Anyhow, horrible stuff. Well, let's talk about scientific notation for a second, because let's face it, in chemistry class, we're going to talk about really big numbers all the time and then we're also going to talk about really small numbers all the time right huge numbers and little numbers now look at the top here this is really funny it says the number of carbon atoms the number of atoms sorry in 12 grams of carbon or the number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon is 602 to the i don't even know what number that is that's a that's a big number okay now, some of you are thinking, well, Mr. Dion, haven't you heard of the mole? Yes, I have, but I haven't introduced it yet. So we'll do that another day. But let's just say it's a really big number, okay? We can even write here, huge, huge number, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody told me to write that number down, I'm the kind of guy that I would probably miss a zero or I might add an extra zero. Just, you know, might make, it make, might make a little mistake, okay? And so in order to express really big numbers, what we do is we use scientific notation and we go all the way over here and we take the decimal place and we see how many places we have to move that. So we move it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So if I take 6.022 and I multiply that by 10 to the power of 23, so 10 times 10, times 10, times 10 right? If I multiply it by 10 to the power of 23, I get the same number. And so scientific notation is a very powerful way to express really small numbers. So when you have a number that's bigger than one, you move the decimal place to the left and you count how many places you've moved it and then you multiply it by 10 to that number. Let's try it for a really small number. It says here that the mass of a single carbon atom in grams is, whoa, that's a really small number. They forget their units here. But anyhow, it's a really small, small number. Point zero, 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 zero. You know, I'm losing count. Again, I'll repeat. I'm the kind of guy that would make a mistake on this. I'm sure I would botch it. So let's count backwards, okay? Let's move the decimal place to the right, and you can see that it's 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, shoot, 20, 
20, 21, 22, 23. There you go, times 10 to the negative 23. This would be on the new prescription. Anyhow, so if you were to take the number 1.99 and multiply it by 10 to the negative 23, right? You would end up with that number. So here's a summary. It says we use this formula, n big N times 10 to the power of lowercase n, where big N or uppercase n is a number between one and 10. We call that number the mantissa or the mantissa, I think sometimes it's pronounced that way. And the lowercase n represents n as a positive or negative integer. Now remember, if the n is a positive integer, that means the number is, okay, the number is larger, larger than one. I guess I could use mathematical symbols here, right? And if it's a negative integer, that means it's less than one, okay? Let me erase that and make it prettier. So we'll use larger than one and less than one. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on scientific notation. You're like, this doesn't intimidate me. I can express a big number or a small number. Good, great. Scientific notation is usually something that most people learn in, in um, you know, their later years of, of junior high or high school, but it's always good to review it. Um, and now let's look at some, uh, some rules for when we're using scientific notation. How the heck do you use it, right? What do I do? Well, um, there's some rules, okay? First of all, we're gonna try um, converting some numbers into scientific notation. Let's try the first one, which is A, it says 5,687. 0.72. This is a number that's greater than one, right? The number is greater than one, so that we're going to move the decimal place to the left. So one, two, three, and so this is going to be equal to 5.68772 times 10 to the third power, right? If I took the number 5.68772 and I multiply it by 10 to the third, 10 to the third is a thousand, I would end up with that number. All right, let's try this one. We have a number that is less than one, 0 0.006452. So we're going to move the decimal place to the right. One, two, three, four, five places like that. So if we have 6.452 times 10 to the negative five, we're going to end up with that number. Now let's look at some rules for addition and subtraction. Addition and subtraction, I'm not going to spend all day talking about that. I think this might be worth the value of one multiple choice question on your first exam, and that's about it. Because addition and subtraction in scientific notation, I, I find that sometimes students find this tricky. But let me tell you, all you've got to do is you've just got to make sure that this that you use the same exponents for both of your numbers that are expressed in scientific notation. So what I'm saying is that you can't add these two numbers this way because we have different exponents. This one's to 10 to the power of 4, and this one's to 10 to the power of 3. So you've got two options, my friend. You can either express this one to 10 to the power of 3, or you can express this one to 10 to the power of 4, right? So that they're both to the same power. Now, what they've chosen here in this example is to express both of them to the power of 4, and then you just add these numbers together. So you would literally punch in your calculator, I'm doing it right now, 4.31 plus 0.39, and you end up with 4.70. And then it would be to the fourth power. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the rules for addition and subtraction with, um, with scientific notation. Cha, all right. I know it's six o'clock and I said I would stop at six o'clock, but come on, let's be real. We're having so much fun. Everybody's really into this right now, as am I. So let's just talk for a few more minutes. And uh, trust me, I'll give you enough time so that you can get to you can get to the to get to the can get to the lab. Sorry. All right. Um, if you're doing multiplication, you have to um, you can simply add the exponents shown here. If you're doing division, then you then you subtract the exponents. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I really wanted to get into significant figures with you guys tonight because you have to know the rules, as, as Dr. Garcia calls it, the rules for significant figures. Okay, I can't express this enough. But every single person who's hearing my voice right now has to have all of these memorized. And you know what? And you're like, oh, this should be on. It looks like a lot of text to just memorize. You know what, you guys? 
What's the best way to memorize this? Who can answer that? I'll give you a clue. I mentioned it a few times already this evening. I'll give you a clue. Starts with P, ends with Ractus. That's right. You're exactly right. I like the way that my students think. Exactly. The best way to master anything in chemistry class is to practice, practice, practice. Okay, so the first rule is that any digit that's not the number zero is a significant figure. Done. So if you have this number 1.234, you have four sig figs because there's no zeros in there. You're like, Mr. Dion, this is a cinch. Well, hold on. Basically, all the rest of the rules are trying to figure out when zeros are significant and when they're not, right? So here we go. Okay. If a zero is sandwiched in between two non-zeros, it's going to be significant. So you have 606. That zero is significant because it's between a six and a six, and those are both non-zeros. If you have a zero to the left of a non-zero, so we, so we sometimes call these, I'll write it over here. Sometimes we call these leading zeros, leading zeros, because they're at the beginning, okay? They're at the beginning of the number. Leading zeros are always insignificant. They don't matter a hill of beans, okay? So that means that if you have this number 0 0.08, you only have one significant figure. Let me show you another example. I'll back up. Who could tell me how many significant figures there are in this huge number right here? The way it's written. Absolutely. So Reagan, Reagan put three. So did Bruce. Absolutely. You're all correct, right? Because all of these zeros here, all of these leading zeros, they're insignificant. The only numbers that are significant are the one, the nine, and the nine. You're, you're absolutely 100% correct, people. All right. What else? If a number is greater than one, then all the zeros to the right of the decimal point are significant. So if you have a decimal, anything to the right of that decimal is significant. And if the number is less than one, the zeros that at the end, um, at the end and in the middle of a number are significant as well. So I'll just point out again in this last example before we try some practice here that these again, oops, I keep choosing the wrong color, that these leading zeros are insignificant. But this trailing zero here is significant because it comes after a non-zero with a decimal in it. All righty, we're rocking and rolling now. We're cooking with gas. Rules for operations with significant figures. If you're doing addition and subtraction, the answer cannot have more digits to the right of the decimal point than any of the original numbers. So if you look at this problem right here, if I asked you this problem on your first exam, how many significant figures should you have? Well, let's type this into our calculator first. We have 89.775 plus 2.54236. Okay, you can even hear me crunching my calculator. I, have, I ended up 92.31736. Whoa, Nelly, that is too many significant figures. Can anybody tell me where I should have stopped here? How many significant figures should I actually have? Yeah, I should have stopped. Somebody put the number seven. You're absolutely right. I should have stopped there because the way that I, how I know how many decimal places to report, you can see here that this number has three decimal places and this number has five decimal places. Three is going to be the winner. And so I can only report one, two, three decimal places. And so I'm going to remove those two numbers. And so the actual final answer is 92. 0.317. That's the correct answer. All right. I'm going to make sure that, or I'm going to ask you to watch the video to solve the other problem. That will be Dr. Garcia's video. So, Dr. Garcia's videos. Okay. Where she would probably solve this one. I didn't watch the entire thing yet. Um, let's try another one. This problem involves multiplication and division. It says here the number of sig figs or significant figures in the result is the, is set by the original number that has the smallest number of significant figures. And so if you look at this problem here, 4.51 multiplied by 3.66 point, sorry, 3.6658, you see that this number has three significant figures, and this number has five significant figures. And so the number that has the least number of significant figures, that's the boss, okay? That is what we use to decide that our answer will only have three sig figs. 
So when I punch this into my calculator, 4.51 multiplied by 4.51 times 3.6658, I end up with, let me delete that first, I end up with this big number, 16.532758, right? But the calculator is misleading me because you should only have three sig figs. And so we're only going to take this part of our answer. And so our answer is going to be 16.5 is our final answer. If you're wondering, you know, Mr. Dion, will sig figs be important for the entire semester? What do you think the answer is? I'll answer it for you. The answer is yes. Absolutely. Significant figures will always matter. They will always be significant. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Let's try a question here. I'm going to ask you guys. Let's try this one. What about A? Can anybody tell me how many significant figures there are in 478 centimeters? Trevor, Madeline, you're both on the ball. Zach, it's three significant figures. Let's try. What about D? How many significant figures in 0 0.043? Absolutely. Two significant figures. Let's try one more. Um, hey, I'll, I'll give you a tough one, okay? Let me ask you a tough one. What about F? Yeah, so <laughs> somebody put one to four. Yeah, the answer is that this one is ambiguous. Yeah. Now, somebody put one because there's no decimal. And technically, that a lot of books will say that. But the answer is that you're not really sure. Okay, you're not really sure if it has one, two, three, or four. And if you're like Mr. Dion, well, how the hell would I solve a problem that you give me that you get that you give me seven thousand with no decimal? I will never ask you that. Okay, if I write seven thousand milliliters on an exam, I'm going to put the decimal there so that you know that there would be four significant figures. So the answer to this one could be anywhere between one and four. It's technically ambiguous. Um. And I'd actually have to look to see what Chang says in his textbook because it will differ depending on where you look. And if you're like, well, come on, Mr. Dion, shouldn't you know the textbook frontwards and backwards? Well, what I would say to you is this. I teach from several textbooks. And something else that I've learned in the year 2020 is that many, many of my students love to go to YouTube and they'll look at videos on YouTube. And, they'll say, and sometimes they'll come back with, you know, varying opinions on some things. And so, um, yeah, anyhow, just something to kind of uh, keep in your head there. Anyhow, all right. It's already 609, and I'm not going to assume that everybody lives very close to Rampart Range campus. And so I'm going to stop recording right now. And that doesn't mean I'm, I'm done talking. I'm never really done talking.